This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea as to the meaning of the word? Hello. Hello, just Chris. Yeah. Andrew's traveling. Yeah. For Christmas. Heading home. I assume yeah. he's in North Carolina by now. I don't know. His Twitter sounded like it was best trying to get off the ground. Like I woke up, got on Twitter, and I was like, ooh, Andrew's active. I also imagine if he had an early flight that Andrew probably just stayed up all night and was like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been to the airport at 4.30 twice last week, so I should have flown in and driven him to the airport <laughs> at 4.30. That'll just be my new side job. So what is this? So it's Christmas Eve, 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 something like that. Yeah, it's early. Eve to the I'm, fifth or whatever. It's the 20, 21st. You're looking festive, though. I was out of clean clothes, so I had some Christmas pajamas, and I forgot <laughs> I was wearing them, and I got on a call with Andrea like an hour ago, and I was like, oh, <laughs> yikes. So I embraced it. <laughs> That's how it is. I can't believe this year's almost over already. I know. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. It went by pretty quickly. I had more vacation days to use. I had the sabbatical, which was awesome, but the sabbatical doesn't count towards your vacation days. So, like, I feel Ooh. like I was just off work for a month yeah. and now I'm off for basically two weeks. So, that's super nice because the sabbatical is, I think, I feel like it's pretty rare for companies to offer that and then on top of that, it doesn't count towards your vacation time. So that year, you really get a lot of time to just reflect and stuff and take time off and do some things you need to get done or whatever it is. So yeah. that's sweet. I'm yeah, jealous. it's cool. The only time I've ever heard sabbatical is in like schools and churches. So it's the right. other times I've heard yeah. it is. Yeah, it's pretty great. That's a huge perk. I forget what is it like every three years or every, five years or something? Yeah. Every three years, so four and a half to take mine. And what's nice about it is it's not then three like, years from when I took it. It's yeah, three years earn. from when I was eligible last. So Great. the next two and a half years will be eligible again. Or actually, no, so if, year and a half. So if you stack them up, eventually you could take a whole year off. I guess. <laughs> At that point, I think that's what they call retirement. Uh, yeah, so. you're like, well, I stacked up. 400 months so i think it'll be fine for a while just <laughs> yeah, retire but you're still technically employed <laughs> something like that yeah, it, somebody's it, gonna have to test those edge cases that's what we do as programmers so if hr that. set up the rules we just gotta play with those <laughs> true that <laughs> hr is gonna get learn about logic real fast what's good what's your last four days since we talked been like I don't even remember. It feels like everything's been kind of a blur lately, probably because of the baby. So Go Rails isn't going to get a big update this coming year. And one of those is like, I really want to move everything over to Jumpstart. And so the first step's probably going to be moving over uh, all the payments code to pay, which is hilarious right now because that's where I originally wrote all the payments code. But it was back when... Stripe was very simple before SCA. And then mm -hmm. it got like the bolt on upgrade for SCA. And it was the first place I ever implemented Braintree. So it's got its own thing for that. And then I was started lately as I like switched to using Stripe checkout for it. We pull out webhook code and other snippets from the page gem. <laughs> and so rather than replacing all of that, I was just like, oh, we'll just grab what we need and kind of like eventually migrate it all the way over to pay. So this week's kind of been the full transition to that. But then I'm looking at the database and I'm like, we store the Braintree subscription ID. So not my favorite, proudest moment of pay, but Stripe oh, and Braintree. Braintree. And, and yeah, no kidding. All three of those like operate so differently. And then we don't have a lot of users using Braintree or whatever, like Stripe's definitely by far the most used. So we never built a sync function for Braintree subscriptions, which we have in Stripe. And like, if you ever have a webhook come in, you just say, hey, sync it, and it will grab the latest data, even if the webhook was like out of order or any of those issues, maybe it gets delayed by five days or something crazy. 
it'll still sync and always have the accurate data. The Braintree stuff was still the old approach. And I don't think it has as many conflicts and stuff as the Stripe stuff does, or I just wasn't using it enough and didn't have the volume to like notice those issues. But Stripe has a tendency to like check out session completed, subscription created, uh, charge happened, and several things that will run kind of at the same time. The webhooks will all fire for sort of the same activity. Because if you create a subscription through a checkout session, you're going to end up with a webhook for the checkout session, the subscription created, the payment succeeded, the charge succeeded for that invoice, and probably several others. And it's kind of like going to bombard you. But Braintree is like very minimal on their webhooks, which is annoying. For example, frustrating piece is... So I couldn't even figure out for 30 minutes like how to sync a Braintree subscription because there's no customer ID on the subscription. The way you find the customer ID is you have to go also look up the payment method and it has a customer ID on it. And I was like, are you serious? Like it felt like I was telling Colin this. It feels like the data they include in their webhooks are here's the database record. Let's convert it to JSON and give it to you. And we've denormalized it because we know the customer through the payment method and we don't need to duplicate it on the subscription. But it's like Stripe does all this stuff. So in general, you get all the information you need as best as they can without serving up the whole database or whatever. So like a charge won't include refunds, but you can ask it for that. But it always either give you the customer ID on a subscription or whatever. And it's very convenient and designed for convenience, but this brain tree stuff is like such a pain. So I got that built and then we can start replacing the logic in there. And for the most part, it'll be pretty straightforward because we just need to convert the every user has like the payment information on the user, which is fine. But since pay extracts that to a customer table, pay customer table, we're just going to go through every user, create the associated record, Then if they have a subscription, do the same, create the subscription record and then sync it and grab the latest data from the API. And then all we need to do is say, when we're checking if you're subscribed to GoRails, we just check the pay subscription instead of the user's subscription. And that should be it. The actual bigger probably effort is switching the cancel, resume, and that functionality out which will probably just copy from the Jumpstart controllers and views and eventually migrate the whole thing over to Jumpstart in the future. But it'll be sort of piecemeal. But I'm like, oh, this shouldn't be too hard. And then like, oh, we don't have the sync feature for Braintree yet. So I got to go build that first. And then I got to probably finish that, write tests, ship that as a new version of Pay. Then we can get back to working on the migration and it just spirals out of control sometimes. But The good part is everybody gets to benefit from this stuff, not just us. So that's a win, I think. (laughs) Yeah, it's helpful for you to actually be a user of pay full time on Mm GoRails and then subsequently jumpstart. So yeah, like it benefits others because both those things, we started after we met and you had already been doing GoRails a long time. So like, I imagine there's a lot to sew together there. There definitely is a ton of, you find those like rough edges that you knew were a rough edge, but now you're actually forced to use it and you're like, screw this, I'm going to fix it before I use this because it's just not worth the hassle of working around it and knowing like it's not right and you should go fix the open source library or whatever. So yeah, it's kind of painful like that sometimes because you end up sort of If you were just doing this for your day job, instead of doing this as a kind of an open source business like we've got, we do the work twice as thoroughly almost because if it was just for GoRails and no one was going to ever see the payments code, we would have shipped the rough edges version and that would have been fine. That's what we've been running on forever. So it works and it's fine, but we can then in this way, benefit everybody else who wants to use pay and have us take care of those painful things. And then your Rails checkout code can be as streamlined as we can hopefully make it. It's still going to be complicated because we need to support the million different ways that you can accept payments. So that's fun. But yeah, it's interesting. 
I really like the dual benefit of like, I get to build a feature for Go Rails, but I also get to improve this for pay and all the Jumpstart users. So the work I'm doing benefits not just us, but thousands of people. So it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Have you ever done metered billing in Stripe? No, I've only done per seat billing. I haven't done oh, yeah. metered. Right, right, right. So we're using that on the new Hatchbox. And speaking of all this payment stuff, we had an interesting situation that I didn't even realize was a thing. So I have a customer who is paying for Hatchbox and they're subscribed and their last payment succeeds. Their next payment is strangely larger than it should be by like $3 or something. And I thought you were about our, to tell me like 300%. No, that would have been much more like obvious. There was some like flaw. Right. But we're doing meter billing on Hatchbox and it's $10 per server per month. And this bill was like $13 and something. And it's never exactly $10 because the seconds in a month vary and we report every four hours. So we have basically a cron job that will every four hours go and see how long that server has been running and it reports that seconds of usage. And we have to also create these records in Stripe. So we create a record locally and we create it in Stripe and we can always like compare them and stuff or so I thought. They don't actually have a way to like delete usage records in their API, which is very strange to me. Of course they don't. I'm sorry, <laughs> CJ, I know you're listening and I love you. And I know I've been negative about Stripe lately and I hope you don't hate me. They're getting these things polished, but I think there's not as many people using this stuff. So they're not getting the feedback on it and not prioritizing those fixes. Cause why would you, right? Anyways, yeah, you have to like record the timestamp so that you can set it to zero. If you create one and need to like delete it, it's never deletable, which makes sense. But yeah, here's the interesting thing. This guy gets charged an extra $3 and I'm like, what in the world happened? Did my cron job screw up? Guarantee you it was something I did wrong. Something weird. He tells me too that he somehow ended up with two subscriptions. So Maybe he clicked the button twice or something happened and he ended up subscribing twice. And I'm looking through my cron job and I'm like, we go through every active subscription and then add usage records for each of your servers. So maybe that's how he got charged more because he had two subscriptions and I could see that adding duplicate records. Well, it didn't because the usage record code was correctly seeing, hey, the last usage record we created it was that timestamp. So the, when it did another one, it was only for like 60 seconds or however long it took to get to the next subscription in the cron job. And I was like, well, it appears that it's working right. But your invoice, I'm scrolling through on Stripe's dashboard and the invoice shows each of the usage records or you can at least dig into them. And at 7 a.m. or 4 a.m., the first like report of the month, it was like 268 hours instead of four hours. And I was like, what the hell is that? How did that happen? And so I go back to look at the previous invoice, which is paid and it was a correct dollar amount. And that one was like 11 days earlier as the last usage record. And so somehow 11 days disappeared between the two, which happens to be 268 hours or whatever. And I'm like, wait a minute. I was minute, literally doing the, the math. And I was like, wait a minute, what the hell is this? And I realized that when I'm looking at that invoice, I start looking around for other stuff and I see that it failed to be paid successfully a couple times. So I guess when Stripe does their next invoice, that failed payment had shifted their billing period. So he didn't get billed. Whoa. He got like... What was it? September 21st, October 21st, or whatever was the first invoice. And then the next invoice starts November 1st and goes to December 1st. And I was like, well, what the hell happened to October 22nd through the end of the month? And oh, because of those failed up payments, like subscription they scheduling shift, too. Yeah, they shift the subscription schedule. And I didn't know that or expect that. And it may be something just for meter billing or whatever. I don't know. And it took me a long time to find that because I was assuming I made a mistake. My first time implementing this, easy to make a mistake or whatever. Little things like that are 
when you're, it's your first time building something like that, yeah, you expect that it's your fault. So their next invoice doesn't actually list all of the records like it does for the current billing period. It like aggregated them all into that first one for the previous 11 days. I would just expect the invoice to be from October 22nd to December 1st or whatever. But it was just like for that month and it happened to like compress all those into one record. And I was like, this is weird. So everything was working fine, but it took me forever to figure out, oh yeah, this is why, because you had failed payments. It's very strange situation that I thought, you know, I'm sure they made some decisions along the way on purpose like that, but it was a hard one to debug. And luckily there was no actual issue there, but sure took a lot of time to figure out what the hell happened. It was strange. Yikes. Yeah, that doesn't sound fun. There was some sales tax work happening around Pody around yeah. the time I left work. And I thought, glad I'm not doing that right before Christmas. Yeah, we got to turn on, I think, sales tax stuff for a couple states for us. And that was one of the reasons why upgrading the GoRails code to pay was worth doing because we've already got all that built out and pay and receipts include that stuff and whatever. Yeah, sales tax is uh, no bueno. It just is such a pain, especially because it's like some of the thresholds are like if you sell to one person in our state, you owe a sales tax or it's like other ones Texas, are more reasonable. Like, like if you do 500,000. Yeah. yeah, that's much more reasonable or like some countries or whatever, like hey, if you uh, do 200,000 customers or something larger, then we won't worry about it until then. But I was talking to my accountant about it. It's like, how the hell do small businesses possibly follow the rules? And he was right. like, the honest truth is they probably can't. Right. It's not feasible because you couldn't even start the business without 100K and investment just to like have your account and make sure everything's right and your developers go build all the shit and whatever. I was like, this sucks. Mm. That is not encouraging anybody to start a startup or a small business or whatever. It's just sad. Whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, everyone has an outage from time to time. When your next outage occurs, transparency is critical. The difference between a minor annoyance that people soon forget and a fiasco that creates sustained resentment is in how you communicate. That's why you need Honey Badger. Honey Badger will be a crucial component of your incident response plan with their uptime monitoring service that now has an exciting new feature, public status pages. Create a new status page with custom domains, branding, and more. Don't let Twitter be the only way your users can find out if your app is down. Sign up for Honey Badger to improve your incident response with a shiny new status page that you will be proud to show your users. Visit honeybadger.io and start giving your users a better experience today and let them know Remote Ruby sent you. Thanks to Honey Badger for their continued support of Remote Ruby. I say this as someone who doesn't have to actually deal with the step after, like the development of it. But I do have a little bit of respect for the way VAT works in the EU. For the most part, like each country has a tax rate. It does get a little weird when you do like some kind of like reverse transaction thing, but I don't know. I respect it because we have 50 different tax rates. Well, not even that. Like in Tennessee, in my county, Tennessee is 9.25, but my county is 9.75. Like they tack on an extra Mm -hmm. 0.5. And so... You got to do it by zip code or whatever for every single transaction. Missouri is the same way. I think every single zip code or county or whatever is different. So there's the state plus whatever the local one is. And it's just a pain. And I don't know, something just changed. There was the, oh, it was the Wayfair ruling for Missouri. So now if you run a marketplace, you have to collect sales tax, not everything online. I luckily live in Missouri, so no sales tax for these digital services like Netflix or whatever. Which is great. But yeah, so I guess if you're doing a marketplace now, you have to abide by that because Google Play emailed me and was like, hey, we're going to have to start charging sales tax in Missouri. And I was like, oh, shit, is that going to mean that it'll apply to us? That'll suck. But I got looking into the rulings and updates for 2023 and it was like marketplaces, which makes sense. Google Play Store is 
primarily just a marketplace. So yeah, fun stuff. But if you sell like clothing online, you can then go through like Printful and then I think get a tax exemption so you can like buy it from them. But then it's like, who's collecting the tax? Do I have to go through Shopify and have them collect the sales tax when the customer does it? Or I assume that's the case. And then like you can buy from Printful, drop ship it to that person, and you don't have to pay a sales tax for the t-shirt or whatever, because that customer's already paid sales tax for it, because it would be like a double thing or whatever. But that's fun. Now that Stripe acquired TaxJar, they have obviously all the Stripe tax features, which costs extra money, but I think only when tax is needed. Because that was the thing is like, if it costs half a percent for every single transaction and 99% of them are not tax, then we're paying a whole hell of a lot of money just for a couple of transactions to collect sales tax. And then I found a link in their docs that was like, hey, if you want help remitting and filing your sales tax stuff, you can use this special tax jar link to sign up and use that to help you file. But you have to pay like $35 a month per filing. And you got to file monthly, at least in some states or maybe quarterly or whatever. But they always want their money as soon as possible. So usually it's more often like every month. And it's like, man, so complicated, so expensive and all this just to like get started. If you want the easy route at this point, paddle and Revin and some other services basically are your merchant of record. So you're not buying from GoRails or Podia. You'd be buying from Paddle and Paddle handles all of your sales tax and stuff, which is pretty cool. Those are very appealing if you live somewhere. Like I know Adam Lavin used Paddle for Tailwind UI and everything because he was in Canada and was like, I just don't want to deal with this. I have to go build the product so we can make any money. And I don't want to deal with the next part of the sales tax stuff. So those are very much more appealing to me now, having looked into all this stuff. Just let somebody else take care of it. (laughs) Have you seen those services that if you were a small business, you basically can get group large plan healthcare by joining them, but you're like an employee of that company and Uh, it works for your own business or whatever. I think that's what Trinet is. Because insurance is crazy in the U.S. It's fascinating. That's nice. Luckily for us, health insurance is covered by the wife. Luckily, she works for a healthcare company, so she gets decent benefits and stuff. And if you're in the U.S., having a spouse that has health insurance and you can go start your startup, that that is sadly a very nice way to do things. It shouldn't be that way, but it's how it is today. So I'm in my Christmas pajamas. So that means Ruby's coming out. Ruby 3.2 is coming out soon. And you started using it. Have you looked at anything (laughs) about it? Just the announcements, but I read them and forget what the new features were by the next day. So somebody had tweeted about 5 to 10% in performance improvement for Yajit. Yajit. Is that that that. right? Or was it just, it was the JIT version, not just plain... Ruby 3.2, right? right? So, yeah. okay, yeah. It's the, I guess, the new Yajit that ships with Ruby 3.2. And I think maybe it was Nate Berkepec. If someone tweeted that, like, actual, not just Ruby, but, like, Rails apps saw that kind of improvement. Yes, which is huge. To get that kind of performance improvement is massive. So, yeah, that's uh, big moves. And I guess at some point, once... Rails or whatever is performant enough, do you think they'll just end up YJIT is enabled by default, like in mm. 3.3 or something? Because if across the board it's faster, maybe it's on by default because it's more memory intensive. So possibly it's disable YJIT and then you can get more memory efficiency if that's what you need but we could say like performance is more important and maybe that'll be the default or something yeah and is that only turned on in production my understanding is you don't really get that kind of benefit if it's not long running yeah yeah and that may be the reason saying this is always an option you enable as opposed to 
it becoming the default. That would make sense. But, you know, in development, I guess, if you are reloading classes and stuff, maybe Rails actually ends up running for a long time locally. And so maybe you do get the benefit of that as a, you know, maybe just the hot reloaded stuff that happens to be your, I guess it's just your code for the most part, not like any of your gems or Rails stuff would end up getting cached. So it might actually help in development if you are running it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking through the 3.2 stuff. The WebAssembly stuff is probably still the biggest part of it. Which is freaking cool. I think Colin sent me a link to something about that. The to do list. So I built a to do yes. list. Yeah. So I looked at that on my iPhone, which was horrible for viewing code. But yeah, basically, there's a way where like you can access the DOM and kind of the same kind of like JavaScript API. And yeah, because this all is all Ruby code. This is wild. There is a require JS line at the top. And then in line 17 here, you have access to doc.getElementById and create element and other stuff in your Ruby code. And so the doc is calling this JS doc is the, doc global. Yeah, the document. So it's finding the like global JavaScript variables and being able yeah. to access them with that. That's freaking sweet. Yeah, so I had no idea you could some do that sort stuff. Of, it's some sort of like, if you wanted to draw a comparison, it's kind of like a C extension almost where you're instead of talking to a C extension, you're talking to the browser directly, which is, <laughs> I mean, this is cool. So we have talked about, you know, it'd be neat to have some interactive stuff on Go Rails, And I don't know that we'll ever be able to like do that necessarily because you need to run a Rails app. So ours are a lot more complex, but the whole Rails for Zombies stuff was really great. And, yeah. you know, we could at least do some Ruby things in the browser this way and have replace, real errors. Yeah. And you could like replace puts with some sort of override that's like, a JavaScript thing to add the error in the browser and stuff. You know, we could probably build something cool for beginner Ruby content and whatever like that. Yeah, I don't know. It's pretty cool. I don't know the business use case for it or like, how would you use this for production? But because it's possible, now people can start experimenting with new creative ways of using this. Using and abusing, of course. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> Postgres in the browser. Yes. It's just awesome that it's even possible. That it is cool. That is the end of the story, you know? Like, go play with it, go come up with cool things that we never would have thought of. I see I mean, some small... I mean, I say small. There's nothing... I'm sure it's a lot of work involved, but there's nothing that stands out right now that's like... Oh, there was... day-to-day -day development. Yeah, there's nothing I think that'll like break your existing stuff. They did introduce that data immutable class or whatever. Right. That is cool. It's kind of like a struct that you can't modify. So I can see that being used for a lot of things. But I think what's nice is in theory for everybody, as long as you're on Ruby 3, it should be an easy upgrade. Maybe some gems will have C extensions that need to get like tweaked a little bit for API changes in the C code. But like for the most part, it should be an easy update. It's not like you're going from 2.7 to 3 or a major version change like that. I saw a tweet. I, mean, I think maybe Kyle Kiesling posted it. There is this new API in Rails 7.1 where with Active Record, you can declare an attribute like normalize this attribute with so like for emails you could be like normalize email with and then you give it a proc and so then you take that value and you can call down case and instead of overriding your setter for it exactly it has that does that also apply if you pull it out of the database i wonder yep it's two-way nice I'm that's I'm, great because i'm pretty sure it's two-way i'll put it that way I was going to say that would make the most sense because like active record encryption, the best coolest feature of that was that you could apply it to existing data and it would be able to use that data, then encrypt it and save it back as the encrypted version. So you could use it on existing stuff without adding a new column and migrating stuff and then dropping the old column. That whole process was kind of 
a big pain. So having it normalized with existing unformatted data when you pull it out and when you save it back and it's normalized each way, that would be solid. I don't see anything about the like coming out part of okay. it, but, yeah. but there is what I was thinking of. It'll even work when you say like find by and give it oh, neat. an email that's Yeah, because it knows the wrong. attribute that you're looking yeah. up. That's really cool. And then even if it doesn't on its way out, when you save the record, it should, I would right. assume, run that as just... a validation kind of step almost. And then it's got to happen, I guess, at a different level above the validations, but that is freaking cool. So in theory... You could add it and then I guess find each and save all your records and just update them if you needed to, but you can probably work around it as well as yeah. you migrate. That's one of those that's things cool. I saw. I was like, yeah, like that's like kind of a quality of life thing. I haven't seen one of those in a while, it feels like. So. And this is when everybody says that Rails is dead and whatever, like there's such awesome things happening, but there are all these little smaller quality of life things like all the hot wire changes that have happened in the past year and stimulus has gotten a lot of cool things and turbo's got a lot of bug fixes and other cool things being added to it it's not like a whole new framework or anything else has come out it's all these quality of life things that really make it easy to say like now we don't have to worry about whether your email is lowercase or whatever like it's already done for us we don't right. have to rely on the database to take care of that what a really good example in that PR here for normalizing is spaces or tabs that are invisible and might cause a user to sign up and you forgot to chomp the string, then you can't ever find their account again because there's space in there. And that would be really strange. So this is really neat. I love this stuff. Like it's not major wins, but there are such small wins that add up to a big win. This feature is just merged or something. Yeah, it's today. It was created last December 20th. So <laughs> that was a long time. Yeah, I think I saw Jeremy Smith say, like, I've been watching this for like five months now. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, probably these things are tough. So it, it requires a lot of feedback from developers and stuff just to get the right wording and stuff and options and. That's always something I've respected the Rails core team and just other people who are building things with these interfaces because they spend a lot of time like, how do we name this? Uh, Casper is the one that comes to mind of like, mm -hmm. I love hearing how he thinks through what's the right terminology for this? And then how's the right arguments for this? And how do we design it in a way that's human understandable at the very top? importance level and then work backwards from there how do we like make that actually function i think that's a cool part about ruby in general encourages that because you're not like working around language limitations i will say like javascript when i see those is blank or the method names that clearly would love to have a question mark at the end but they right. don't support <laughs> that and they're like trying to make some english phrasing that's like is boolean is true or whatever, I see that as a limitation of the language. They can't express what they want to express, so they have to work around it. And I want every language to support that. Do One you, thing or just, do you want to just use Ruby everywhere? Eh, I mean, it'd be cool, but I can't imagine using, with all the stuff that's done, how much would we have to redo to use Ruby in the browser? I don't the want browser, to use Ruby in the browser. Can you imagine... You'd have to ship the language embedded in the browser. It's probably going to be out of date. It'll be like Ruby 2.6, and then you will be on 3.2, and then they'll finally upgrade <laughs> to 3.0, and it's still missing things, and we'll like end up dealing with all those compatibility things. Just I feel like they've it. just... Well, Bring Ruby with you. Bring it everywhere yeah. you go. And then you got a gem install in the browser. How's that going to work? <laughs> That's going to be fun. You got um, a gem install ahead of time? and Yeah, just like, oh... Over. Instead of the React loading thing, it's like gem install, all that. <laughs> <laughs> then Bundler has an issue. Like, oh. you just can't load the page. Oh. I saw that the Rails Conf committee is looking for applications. So if anybody 
is interested in reviewing CFPs and getting involved in helping out the conference and all that stuff. We'll have a link to that in the notes. We'll go find that. But hard to believe that here in five months, is it May? It's in April this, this year. April this year. It's okay. usually in May, but it's like the end of April. That's what I was going to say. So in a few months, we'll be all hanging out in person. I'll have to find a place to uh, do another Go Rails meetup and stuff. I'm excited about that. We had you so much fun last time. MailChimp. They're headquartered in Atlanta. They'll let you use Oh, are they? That's cool. Well, they were um, before they sold for $14 Honestly, though, I think we can just all show up at Paul's house and like yeah, that's what not Paul tell wants. him ahead of time. We'll hang out in the studio. Yep. Yep. Paul will play his favorite true crime podcast he's edited for us and we'll <laughs> drink. One day I aspire that Remote Ruby has a true crime episode. <laughs> I'm going to like go missing or something. And that's what the <laughs> podcast is going to turn into is just. There's a couple other things that came to mind as I was scrolling through Discord. One is for anybody who's been like, when are we going to get a Docker file for Rails? Now you have two. So Rails is going to ship with Docker files that are production designed. And then Docked is a gem-ish thing. It's not even really a gem. It's, it's like a script. Some, it's Yeah, it's kind of just some aliases that, or one core alias that okay. is a Docker file for development that he's already made. And you just like boot your Rails up using his Docker image. Which okay. isn't going to be perfect because you're going to need extra dependencies. They haven't really talked about any of that stuff yet, but it will work automatically with your base Rails image. And then you have like libvips already there. So if you need some extra stuff, like you can copy the Docker file from this repo and build your own Im image for development, but it'll work with bin dev and stuff, which is great. So I'm excited to see, you know, a little movement on that. I did like that it was like, not a gem, not anything fancy. It's just kind of as minimal as possible. I thought that was a good approach. I guess it's changed since I looked at it because... It used to be like, here's 12 aliases yeah, that you should add to your batch RC. I, I was immediately <laughs> turned off by that. I was like... Now it's I just mean, one. That's what a Laravel sale does. Is like you run sail and then the Laravel command. And that it looks like now that's what... Yeah, uh, so now is. you run docked bin dev or docked Rails server or docked Rails DB migrate, and it basically just shoves that command into the Docker command for you. So you don't have to. That's the fun part about Docker is like you got to run seven flags and eight arguments and whatever just to run like any basic Docker command. <laughs> and so it's the alias approach is uh, pretty solid. If you didn't want to add this to your terminal, you could actually just make a bin docked file and make a bash script out of it or whatever. And just like you do with bin dev, you could actually just shove this stuff in there if you wanted. But it's just nice that there's an official example of here's how to run Rails with Docker in development. And then the Docker file from when you generated Rails 7.1 app, it'll ship with that and you have a production example. And I'm pretty sure somebody has already deployed to fly.io with the official oh, wow. Docker image. So it's like, that's pretty cool. Good, good to go. It's been tested. I was looking at how Laravel Sale does it. Cause what you do is you just copy this curl command and pipe it into bash. So it's the URL is a bash script. And that's, oh, that's really so clever. If you like living life on the edge, cause the risk there is if anybody can intercept that request and give you their own bash script, <laughs> then you're screwed. So sure. it's really cool and also really dangerous. So it just keeps being used because it's so convenient, but all the security people are all like horrified by that. And speaking of horrified about security things, I saw an article on my phone earlier that Okta's source code has been stolen after their GitHub repositories got hacked. Who? Which it, Okta, like the single sign-on service. Oh. Like the... Okay, yeah, TA. Like, cool. yeah. I was like, oh God. For one, it's just hilarious when you kind of think about the business model and it's basically, hey, just give us all your authentication. We'll take care of it for you. Like, <laughs> what if you didn't own any of the authentication stuff? Maybe it's convenient, but my God, that sounds dangerous. 
to like mm. just give it to another third party. And then, yeah, sure enough, might have been a pretty bad move. <laughs> Computers, huh? Sorry, I fell down a Laravel sale rabbit hole. <laughs> like, how do they oh, do yeah, it? Are you learning any good stuff? <laughs> everything they do, I always think is so polished. I still mean to go back through the Laravel commits and see if I can find, like, was there a pull request that Taylor made for the changes needed to build Laravel Vapor so it would run on Lambda? Mm. Because I was just kind of like, I wonder what they had to jump through, and I wonder if it's possible that we We could could do the same. (laughs) But I think it might be, well, I don't remember exactly how the Laravel stuff comes in, but PHP being PHP, where you can just kind of hit the URL and go to the PHP version of the file or whatever. I don't know. Do they all direct the routes through like an index.php or? Okay. It's been like seven years since I looked at this, but I one time followed that PHP trail, uh, that yeah. Laravel trail. And I think it was like an index.php entry point that then actually loads the framework. Like Nginx would take any route send it to the one file and then right. Laravel runs off that. That would make sense because otherwise you'd have to respond to every one and then have like a matching folder structure or whatever with index.php right. files everywhere. Because I was just wondering, oh, it would be so cool to have a Laravel Vapor thing for Rails. And I know we've got Ruby on Jets and Lambi, but I've never really tried those yet. And I think Lambi is probably the closer one that it's kind of like, here, let's try to transform your Rails app to run in Lambda. Because I feel like last time I looked at Ruby on Jets, you had to kind of build some stuff that was a little bit more specific to that. And a little yeah, less what, like typical it Rails. A, a Rails app. It was more like yeah. Rails-like. Yeah, like it feels similar, but operates differently, if I remember right. It's cool stuff, though. I'm excited about that kind of thing. I was talking with Seth in the Go Rails Discord. See Seth Code, I believe is his username. And they've got like background jobs that they have Rails trigger that actually gets processed by Crystal for performance and stuff. And I was like, this is sweet. That's really cool. And then it just got me thinking about like, oh, it'd be neat to peel off some of your routes and have them go run on Lambda and run very similar code. And hopefully you could share all of your active record models. Because I was asking him that, like, yes, you could have your jobs, send them over to like your background job processor. But if you're going to use active job to do that, active job has its own serialization for global IDs and other stuff and hashes and classes and whatever. So do you have an equivalent in Crystal? And then also, do you have the active record equivalent? Because if you're operating on database records, you got to have sort of the same way to look them up and associations to find, I would assume. And you might be able to get by with doing a lot less of that if the job was very specific for a subset of all of your models. But who knows, at some point, you might need the whole thing duplicated in two code bases between Ruby and your ORM for Crystal. And I was like, oh, it sounds <laughs> really cool, but also a lot of work. But it depends on where the problem lies. Do we need everything? Do we not? It'd be cool to build like C extensions with Crystal where you could mm-hmm. have like speed in that or whatever. Because I yeah. think switching to Rust or C is just a big context switch for most Ruby developers that they're not going to go that far. But Crystal is very appealing and a lot more familiar and maintainable too for uh, anybody who just does Ruby and JavaScript 99% of the time. Yeah. I feel like we've been talking. I actually gave a talk on Crystal in like 2017. I think it's such a cool language. The other thing about Ruby is like there's just such an ecosystem. It's hard to move away. I guess. Maybe I'm just not at a point in my life where I just, I like the consistency in the community and the this is your, and This is your COBOL. This is your last language you ever write. I always say I'm going to learn Elixir and then I start like a Phoenix project and I always get to like the second controller and I'm like, ah, I'll just do this in Rails. Yeah. Uh, well, unless there's some major benefit you're going to get out of doing it. It's hard not to just be like, oh, we'll just keep using Rails because I'd be done faster if I did it in Rails because I know it well. 
And it's hard to just be like, I'm going to choose to be slow on this project. That is tough. That's like the frustration I felt learning how to drive a manual car for the first time. (laughs) I'm just going to choose to suck at driving. And it's like, this is really painful. I was just looking at the default Docker file for Rails PR and search for the pull request and it's like, merged but test failed like only if you're the framework owner do you get to do that (laughs) Mm -hmm. there was like some lint failure that was in main but has been since fixed so it was like okay to merge but you still should have pulled main into your branch first and then (laughs) made sure it passed but well that's what you get when you get the keys of the kingdom you can do what you want well I will see you yeah, man. shortly in person. And very I soon. I, Hopefully I can, we can make it down there and there's not 11 inches of snow that we're supposed to get this weekend. There won't be in Memphis. I can almost guarantee you that we're only like four hours apart, but Memphis gets like one snow a year. And usually it's mm. not even snow. It's just like slush. You're uh, giving me flashbacks of I moved to New York City in January without knowing that it snows a lot, but it also is so hot like on the ground because there's so much stuff underground and whatever that it's always just black slush, like the muddiest crap. And when you're walking, you just have to walk through a foot of wet, dirty water and snow. So everybody that was already living there was like giant snow boots, like waterproof (laughs) boots and stuff. And I've got like tennis shoes and jeans. So every time I walk to the office or walk home, like my jeans are soaked all the way up to my knees. And I was like, yeah, this is uh, not very enjoyable. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds terrible. Yeah, it's a dirty, nasty city sometimes, but it's fun. I'm glad I got to experience it. I don't know that I wanted to live there for a long time. Not with kids. That would be a, oh, yeah. a I thought huge that. hassle. I, so, <laughs> like, I know people do it. They must be more badass than I am. So yeah, I think when this goes out, Same. it'll be the end of 2022. So I could probably see there's a week off the next week from us and then we'll get back into it. So yeah, well, I guess we will see you all next year. Just had to throw that in there. Just because it can. Oh, Lord. Goodbye. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. Goodbye.